Greetings, my name is Christopher Paisley. I'm a Philadelphia public school teacher. This is my YouTube channel, Inside White Fragility. Today, I'd like to talk about Christopher Rufo's Critical Race Theory Briefing Book. Now, Christopher Rufo recently published on his website, ChristopherRufo.com, what he calls his Critical Race Theory Briefing Book, and it's a really great resource with lots of information, lots of great links, and I'm going to actually put the link to that in the description of this video, and I would encourage everybody to click on that and to go and check it out. What I'm going to do today is I'm just going to briefly go through the main points of it and the highlights of it um, because it's got some really good information, good material, good resources in it. And for those who are following and investigating critical race theory and its offshoot anti-racism, you will know that Christopher Rufo is one of the leading voices and I would say, in my opinion, scholars of critical race theory. He's done, you know, on the ground, boots on the ground investigations across the country in school districts and government agencies. He's really followed this. He's read through a lot of the theories, a lot of the, you know, background material on this. So he's an expert in critical race theory and its offshoot anti-racism. And he does have this great resource, again, that I want to go through. He starts out with the definition of critical race theory, which I'd like to read. Critical race theory is an academic discipline that holds that the United States is a nation founded on white supremacy and oppression, and that these forces are still at the root of our society. Critical race theorists believe that American institutions, such as the Constitution and legal system, preach freedom of equality but are mere camouflages for naked racial domination. They believe that racism is a consistent universal condition. It simply becomes more subtle, sophisticated, and insidious over the course of history. In simple terms, critical race theory reformulates the old Marxist dichotomy of oppressor and oppressed, replacing the class categories of the Burgoyes and proletariat with the identity identity categories of white and black. But the basic conclusion is the same. In order to liberate man, society must be fundamentally transformed through moral, economic, and political revolution. And if you look at critical race theory and some of these, these theories and these people, and I always say Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi, and people say, well, they're not the only ones. They're not. Okay, but they're the leading voices and they have the biggest best-selling books and their books are ending up in, in government agencies and schools and things like that. So you have to pay attention to what they're saying. But they, they advocate revolution. I know um, Robin DiAngelo does. There's uh, interviews that she's given where she says, you know, the answer is literally, literally revolution, meaning we have to tear it all down because it's all, it's all you know, poison. We got we to gotta restart it. We got to rebuild it. And Kendi seems to at least suggest that it needs to be torn down and restarted, that it's not a fundamentally good place, that it's not a place that's open to equality and liberty and democracy, that it's a fundamental place that's based on white supremacy and white privilege and all of those things. All right. So he talks about key concepts and quotations. He talks about race essentialism. Critical race theory reduces individuals to quasi-metaphysical categories of blackness and whiteness, then loads those categories with value connotations, positive traits are attributed to blackness and negative traits are attributed to whiteness. Okay, although some critical race theorists formally reject race essentialism, functionally, they often use these categories as malicious labels that erase individual identities. And it's true. You could say, like, like for example, Mark Lamont Hill debated Rufo. Mark Lamont Hill said critical race theory is, is supposed to end race essentialism, meaning you're not going to judge a person by their fundamental race. But the irony is then he says, well, race is, isn't real at a biological level. It's just a social construct. But they use the social construct to divide people into oppressors or oppressed and to label and categorize people and attack and target whiteness and all of these things. So although they're saying they don't believe in it at a genetic or biological level, they flip it around and say, well, it's a social construct. So it, ex it exists at a social level and they use the social construct as a way to push these, these ideas which don't really bring us together, which don't really give anybody any real solutions or real skills to make up these racial disparities. It's all politics, and, and it's not really purpose. It's, there's, it's not very useful on a you know interpersonal level, which is why they don't like individualism. It's all about system. It's really just all about politics and power. But does it help the people it's saying it's supposed to help? All right, and then it, it, he, Rufo gets into under race essentialism. He talks about whiteness the way it's been redefined by D'Angelo and others and how whiteness is really this negative thing. Supposedly, it's not about white people, white culture, or the white race. When it really is, it's just playing with semantics. 
and it's and talking about how we need to deconstruct whiteness, we need to target whiteness, we need to disrupt whiteness, but yet somehow that doesn't mean white people and white culture when it really does. Okay, so that's that's what he talks about. He 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 has the phrase "all whites are racist," which is obviously things that Kendi and D'Angelo and others have said. All whites are systemically racist uh, by default. They perpetuate racism. Their silence perpetuates violence and racism. Okay, um, here's another um, premise: America is a fundamentally racist nation. That's what critical race theory believes. All right. Uh, again, white people are raised in this Western society, and it's a white supremacist worldview. That's the default mode of America, this white supremacy worldview, okay? Um, it believes that America America is inherently um, kind of almost like an anti-black country. D'Angelo speaks of this in- inherent anti-blackness, all right? Then there's the idea of collective guilt. Critical race theory claims that individuals categorized as white are inherently responsible for injustice and oppression committed by white populations in the past. So it's like, okay, if you're white, you're not responsible for your life and the things that you say and do now, but you're collectively responsible and guilty of all these crimes that go back hundreds of years, centuries. It's it's you. It's you and it's, it's your culture, your people, or your identity, your whiteness that is responsible. And then it's projected onto people, children, kids in schools, and things like that. It's completely inappropriate. All right. Um, critical race theory, believe it or not, has opposition to equality under the law. Critical race theorists explicitly reject the principle of equality under the law, including the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They argue that legal equality, non-discrimination, and colorblindness are camouflages used to uphold white supremacist structures. So when you try and go to the Constitution and things like that, they'll say that this is this is just West, more Western white supremacy, and it doesn't even exist. Um, they believe that it's fundamentally not equal. And if you try and bring it under these legal uh, constitutional definitions, they'll, they'll, they'll deny it because they'll say the Constitution itself is fundamentally racist, so how could that be used to even decide? All right, there's an opposition to meritocracy, okay, merit-based things, and some things like hard work, it's against it, okay. Um, white people are raised on five strong cultural myths, meritocracy, manifest destiny, white racelessness, monoculture and white moral and managerial su- superiority so it basically takes these va- these unit really these universal values of success that all cultures across all countries across the world if you look at all the cultures and countries across the world that have the people who have success and that have a good quality of life a, a, a manageable life they have these universal qualities but somehow critical race theory has taken these and now it's a projecting and applying them and saying that these are white cultures and this is white supremacy culture all right it, it, it actually promotes active racial discrimination, believe it or not. Critical race theorists believe that the state must actively discriminate against racial groups that are deemed privileged, meaning whites and sometimes Asians. Critical race theorists support policies such as racial quotas, race-based benefits, and race-based redistri- uh, redistribution of wealth. So it is uh, active racial discrimination. Kendi says it. Kendi says he's going to use discrimination to end discrimination. All right, so so there you have it. I mean, it's literally state-sanctioned racism, okay? There's the restriction of free speech. You could go to college campuses. You could go to government agencies. You could go to the military. You can go all over the place, and you're going to see that if people challenge or disagree or speak out against critical race theory or this so-called anti-racism, they're, they're punished or they're, or they're dealt with or they're disciplined or there's always some kind of – usually some kind of a repercussion or they're made to feel intimidated because they don't want to challenge or speak out because they're framed as a racist. All right. There's the idea of the abolition of whiteness. Okay. Critical race theorists believe that society should work to abolish the white race. Literally, we, we target whiteness. We want to deconstruct and disrupt whiteness. You, you can give a bunch of different examples. I talked about that one uh, English uh, movement called Disrupt Text, where they're trying to disrupt all this whiteness and literature and targeting Shakespeare and all of these things. All right. There's neo segregation with these um, affinity groups when people are literally segregated by race and put into these affinity groups supposedly to to help people, you know, talk amongst themselves so then they can later on come back together. But segregating among, uh, according to race, doesn't seem to be helping unify people. It seems to be 
making people more tribal. So it doesn't seem to be helping much. There's an anti-capitalism uh, element to critical race theory. It's, it's more socialist. It's even quasi-communist. It's Marxist. It's anti-capitalism. The majority of Americans are not anti-capitalism. All right, so that was the first component to his book, to, this, to, to what he calls his critical race theory briefing book. All right, the second component is this category called winning the language war, which is really interesting. Critical race theorists have constructed a series of powerful linguistic tools to successfully fight against critical race theory. We must adopt language that is um, persuasive, trenchant, persuasive, and resonates with the public. Here are some powerful words and phrases to include in your communications. All right. Defining critical race theory. And these are great things to use. More and more people need to start using these phrases at all levels of society. Critical race theory is race-based Marxism state-sanctioned racism, woke racism, racial engineering. Critical race theory divides Americans into oppressors and oppressed based on skin color. Critical race theory says the solution to past discrimination is present discrimination. I reject this. Racism is always wrong. I oppose racism whether it comes from the Klan or from critical race theory. Critical race theory teaches that individualism, rationality, and hard work are racist. This is an insult to hardworking American families of all racial backgrounds. Critical race theory rejects the idea of equal protection under the law. I believe everyone has the right to equal treatment no matter where they come from. Okay, here are some phrases for, to, to challenge critical race theory in schools. Basically, what, this, what critical race theory is in schools is race re-education programs. Neo-racist theories have no place in public education. Critical race theory teaches children that they are defined by, the, by their race, not as individuals. Critical race theory teaches children to hate each other and hate their country. And in certain cases, it does that. Critical race theorists have the right to express their beliefs as, as individuals. They do not have the right to use taxpayer money to indoctrinate children. Critical race theory is not a free speech issue. It is a compelled speech issue. And there's a lawsuit going on from a mother in Las Vegas whose son was compelled, a biracial boy and an African-American mother whose son was compelled to say these certain things, these really divisive and polarizing things. The son was being indoctrinated in his public school in, in Nevada, in Las Vegas. Public schools do not have the right to violate a child's conscience. We must prioritize excellence, which inspires people from all racial backgrounds to achieve their potential. Our goal is diversity without division. Okay? So there are just some things to use. Um, Anti-CRT legislation, neo-racist theories have no place in our public institutions. Public institutions must reflect the values of the public, not fringe racial theories that seek to divide Americans into oppressor and oppressed. Okay, these are some things that, these are some really good phrases that you can use at school board meetings that you can start to put into the into the language because we, we all know that language is important and critical race theory and anti-racism and some of these quasi-radical approaches really co-opt the language, redefine the language. You wake up one morning and you don't even know what the heck these terms even mean anymore because they've completely hijacked them and turned them around. There's people right now listening to this who believe that these phrases, that from what they know, oh, why would you be against anti-racism? Doesn't that mean we're fighting against racism? No, actually, it doesn't mean that if you really look closer at what it's doing. Now, maybe your definition of anti-racism is that at your school, but on a broader scale, if you look at it and, and research deeper, anti-racism is really a word that we really have to try and um, get rid of, get, get, get out of the language because it's just inappropriate and it's just, it's, it's a divisive term. We need to get back to the term multiculturalism, trying to bring people together, trying to bring diversity, and we need equality, equal opportunity. We need chances at equal opportunity, not equity, not predetermined, predesigned equal outcomes, which is not organic, which is not natural. Um, obviously, everybody needs a seat at the table. Obviously, everybody needs to have the things to have a good quality of life. But these new terms and these new approaches are not doing that. It's very divisive. It's based not in um, synergy. It's not based where the whole is uh, bigger than the parts. It's based in this zero sum. In order for one group to have something, another group must be disrupted or challenged. It's that mentality. In order for me to have something, I have to take something away from you. That's the approach. That's not a healthy approach. So that's what we have to try and turn away from. All right. Rufo has another part of this document called Using Stories to Build the Argument. He goes into all of the things that he found in all of his investigative reporting in public schools. The Seattle public schools told teachers that the education system is guilty of spirit murder, and San Diego public schools accused white teachers of being colonizers on stolen Native American land and told them that they're racist. 
Cupertino, California, for forced third graders to deconstruct their racial, racial and sexual identities, completely inappropriate, very traumatizing to children, um, and on and on. He goes through all these many, many states across the United States and schools and school districts that are doing different things. All right. And then critical race theory and government, different levels of government, different places. The trainings that they were having, completely, completely inappropriate trainings based on race, literally state-sanctioned racism were going on. And there's now a pushback. And and this is starting to be exposed and they're starting to kind of uh, challenge this and, and get rid of this stuff because it's just completely inappropriate, toxic and polarizing critical race theory and corporations, all right? So coming to the end of this document, he includes polling data, which is very interesting because the majority, the majority of Americans do not want critical race theory and the premises and the the, the approaches behind it. They want multiculturalism. They want equality. They want justice. They want fairness. They want people to have a good quality of life, but they don't want this quasi-Marxist, race-based, oppressive or suppressed, targeting entire groups of people, stereotyping entire groups of people, divisive stuff. You can look at the polling data. People don't want it, okay? They, 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 they don't agree with it, okay? And this isn't just people to the right of center. It's people to the left of center. It's people more in the center. You got liberals. You got conservatives. You got libertarians. They're all, many, many of these people are, are, are on the same page, and they're speaking out against it. Same thing with race. More and more you see parents of color at school board meetings, African-American, Asian, Latino, speaking out in school board saying, I don't want my child indoctrinated with this stuff. More and more, every day, go on YouTube, you can follow it. I follow this stuff. Parents of color, more and more every day, speaking in front of school boards, they do not want their parents being indoctrinated with this stuff. It is just toxic and polarizing. They just don't want it, all right? Then he gets into state legislation, and we're getting towards the end of this here. And this is a really interesting document that he provides. And what Rufo has here is this decision, or I should say this opinion, that was written by the Montana uh, State Attorney General, Austin uh, Kudson, it looks like his name is, um, wrote an opinion. This was a big deal in the state of Montana, critical race theory. Parents were up in arms about this. They went to the state attorney general, and this was just released a couple of weeks ago on May 27th. Um, there was this report that was done or the statement given. So what was found by the state attorney general is this, and I'd like to read this, and you can find this in his document. So this is what the finding was. In many instances, the use of critical race theory and anti-racism programming discriminates on the basis of race, color, or national origin in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Article II, Section 4 of the Montana Constitution and Montana Human Rights Act. So the state of Montana has found that critical race theory discriminates against people. That's the irony of it. Okay, and there's this whole entire opinion that goes into some very interesting things. And they bring up this case of Princeton University, and they have all these footnotes and citations. And there was this issue that happened in Princeton University, which I just want to briefly talk about, where Princeton University, um, the president had stated that Princeton University was systemically and fundamentally racist at all levels of the college. And, and, then, and then there was this issue because people had suggested, well, if, you're, if your college, if your university is institutionally racist and the president is admitting as much, maybe we should cut off your funding. You know, maybe we should have an investigation into your hardcore racism at your school because that's the new kind of the new trendy thing to say. There's racism everywhere. Joe Biden just said it in a commencement speech. There's systemic racism everywhere. This kind of boogeyman idea of racism. There's no evidence in certain situations now obviously there's racism still around and there's evidence of personalized discrimination and prejudice but when you use the word systemic racism this does not mean personalized prejudice and discrimination this just means this kind of systemic invisible institutional thing that's going on so this was supposedly really going on very deeply uh in princeton university and i want to get to the part i want to read this this was cited in in the in the montana attorney general's report um So Princeton was investigated, right? In the face of this investigation, however, Princeton responded that although it is systemically, institutionally, and structurally racist, it does not actually commit discrimination in violation of federal law. Despite its claims that widespread racism permeated through every aspect of campus, it asserted that no one employed by the university has engaged or was engaging in any discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin. The department concluded its investigation by stating that President Eisengruber knowingly and intentionally spoke falsely 
making a factually baseless ritual confession and not an empirically grounded description of campus reality. So that's what's happening across the United States, especially on college campuses and other places. They're saying these kind of ritualistic statements. We have racism everywhere. Like what's going on at Juilliard. You know, there's racism everywhere. It's deeply rooted at all levels of our institution. Well, where's the discrimination and the prejudice happening? Well, there is no discrimination and prejudice happening on a personal level, and none of our staff or faculty are doing it, but there's all this overwhelming, dripping systemic racism throughout the system. These are, this is the kind of linguistic game that's being played, and it's, and it's really disingenuous, and, it, and it's not based in, in facts and data and evidence. All right, so again, there's obviously some racism that still exists in the United States. No one's denying this. No one's going to sit here and say that racism is over. It's clearly not. There's there's much there's many things we need to do to improve. And yes, because of all the historical racism in the United States, there's an institutional uh, trace. There's some institutional racism going on in the United States, and we do need to take an eye on systems. Keep an eye on systems. But to the level and the amount and the approach that it's being done with critical race theory, anti-racism in, in these in these ways, it, it's gone too far. It's gone off the rails. Okay, last year, the George Floyd um, death, which was horrible, tragic, you know, that really made things blow up and kind of, in a way, go, go off, go off the deep end in a way. All right. We need to, we need, people need to have a racial reckoning. Okay. But we need to make sure that we keep it focused in a way that's going to be positive and in the end, unifying. It has to be unifying. Because there's people like Robin D'Angelo who will say, niceness is an anti-racist. When you talk about unity, when you talk about universal values, when you talk about bringing people together, a lot of the critical race theory people and anti-racists say, you can't be nice. It's not about unity. You know, it's, there are no universal values. You know, these race, race, you know, people of color are much different than, you know, uh, white people. You know, you can never understand another person's lived experience in reality. It's very divisive. It's always constantly trying to pull them apart, pull them apart. It's like, we need to figure out a way to communicate better, to come together so that we can solve these problems and do this in a way that is not targeting people. It is not polarizing people, and it is not literally breaking constitutional laws. So again, if you have a chance, go into the description of this video. There is a link to Christopher Rufo, what he calls, I want to get his title right, what he calls the, the Critical Race Theory Briefing Book. Take a look at it. Read it. Look at the links. And if you ever stand in front of a school board or you have an issue that you want to talk about, this is a great resource. It can And it can help bring us together solve problems in a way that's going to be unifying and it's going to be able to give us solutions that are going to make everybody better and stronger and make America continue to be the greatest country in the world.